Alright, and Albatross here again with the Cypher Unlimited crew. We have our usual suspects of AD or Alpha Dean or simply Dean. We have Spigs 18 or Anthony. And uh, Dean, what are we doing today? Well, you know, as usual, we do a lot of talking. We discuss a lot of things. We're always discussing how we're going to make our games different, better, or just more enhanced in some way there or another. And we've been talking about, you know, bringing some grittiness to the game. You know, how can we make Cypher gritty? You know, and what we were talking about it, you know, I was just thinking, why not? What do you think, Ant? Yeah, um, I, I think this is actually a great topic. But before we can, like, really dig deep into it, maybe we should def define what gritty means to us. You know, because I think when, when you hear the word gritty, you know, people will have different ideas of what the definition is in their heads. So, Dean, can you uh, give us a definition and tell us where you got it from? Oh, uh, sure, sure. So what I did was I did do a search for uh, gritty or more realistic, uh, you know, RPGs, which honestly there were no true definitions out there. So what I did was, you know, be a cipher system. I went and found out what gritty was related to when they talked about movies and stuff, since cipher cinematic in nature, why not? So the Urban Dictionary defines gritty as harsh, coarse, rough, and unrefined as in film depictions that portray life as it truly is without false distortions, stylizations, or idealizations. Often the realism is exaggerated such that the culture or society being portrayed appears more coarse than it really is. So think of a movie like 28 Days Later. It's like dirt under your fingernails. It's just plain raw. That's actually a great definition that we could base our discussion on, you know, and it allows us to start thinking about what is grittiness and, and how do we apply that to role playing games. I, I think that maybe one of the first things we should talk about is um, what do you think we should talk about, Al? Well, first we should break it down, you know, talk about a couple of genres that are associated with, you know, grittiness normally in narratives or adventures or whatever have you, stories or films or, you know, role playing games. A lot of genres that fall under that category are, are on this list, but not limited to uh, post-apocalyptic, western, modern crime dramas, modern horror, low fantasy, military campaigns, historical period pieces, urban fantasy, hard sci-fi, and gothic horror. Um, so yeah, let's just br jump right into the discussion. Like, how do we add greediness to a cypher game that might fall into those categories? One thing you can look at just right off the bat, because the cipher system, you look at the ciphers. How do we make ciphers a little more gritty? Oh, well, first off, let's break down our discussion a little further before we dig really in deep. You know, for the purpose of the discussion, maybe we should break it up into two different categories. Like, first, let's look at the mechanical aspects. Like, what can we do within the mechanics of the cipher system to make the game feel grittier? Or to make the game grittier, period, with the mechanics. And last but not least, least, let's break it down narratively to make the game seem grittier. You know, I, and I think we should possibly tackle the mechanic side first. I mean, so Al, you can tackle it that way. Yeah, makes sense. And yeah, minute. yeah, ciphers again are uh, well, they can be used in a narrative way as well, but we'll touch on that later. But the mechanical aspect is you can make them a little more volatile, a little more um, unstable when they're used. Um, something that we threw around as an idea for this is adding some sort of, uh, like, a roll against the cipher when you go to use it. Like, a level five, like, against the difficulty of the, uh, using the level of the cipher as a difficulty number. So, let's say you're rolling on a level five cipher, you know, you roll difficulty 15, or excuse me, five or higher, excuse me, difficulty five, 15 or higher. And, uh, yeah, if you don't pass the roll, the, the, uh, cipher becomes a little more volatile, and yeah, it may leave the uh, what is it? The user open to GM intrusions or some other negative side effects when used. That that's not to say it'll completely negate the positive effect it has, but there'll be some double-edged sword effect if they fail that uh, roll to keep it stable. If that makes sense. And for our listeners that um, uh, you know, are either new to Cipher and or just getting into the Cipher core book, you can find the rules for ciphers on page three seventy seven of the revised. Cypher system rule book. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, and see, that's like like what Al was saying, like with the whole instability idea, you know, um, it's literally not 
adding anything or a new mechanic. It's just what already exists in Cypher. It's basically just saying that, you know, um, with that particular thing, and you know, you could even make it kind of cool where if there's if they fail the instability role, then the GM gets a free intrusion linked to that cipher. So when they use that cipher, the GM can do something, you know, as opposed to the you know, so the cipher works, but the GM gets an intrusion because it's an unstable, you know, it's a cipher with an instability, you know. So that so yeah, I, I mean, I could definitely see how that could um give you the the feeling of grittiness because even normal like I, items that you would normally use in a, a, a normal cypher system game like ciphers have a cost and have an a, effect that you know could constantly change during the game and it gives you when i think of gritty i think of um you know like the unknown the 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 you know like everything is lethal in some sort of way. And I think that's a great way of utilizing ciphers to give you that feeling mechanically. And to piggyback off what you just said a little bit, like that, that unknown aspect or whatever have mm. you, um, something that's in the raw that not really implemented too much in games that I've run or have played in is have the ciphers start off unidentified. They don't know exactly what it is. They'll either have to use it or roll to identify it to tell exactly what it is. And again, that is already in the raw, but not a lot of people really use it because it feels a little clunky in a normal style game. It kind of gets in the way of the narrative. But in a gritty game, it adds to it because now there's that element of unknown. Like, do I use this now? Do I like try my chances of trying to figure it out before I try to use it, depending on the situation at hand in the game, again, it adds that layer of grittiness. Right. And just and just to give an example, let's just say the person does roll, uh, it's a level 5 cipher, they roll a 14, so they didn't, you know, find a stable cipher. Let's just say, particularly, let's just use a grenade, it's easy. So, that particular grenade, it's good, it works but it's old so my gm intrusion would be when they pull the pen and throw it it doesn't blow up immediately it's a it, it, it's another round so you know maybe they're they threw it to stop the advancing of i don't know the zombies are coming or approaching you and you want to blow them up well guess what the first four zombies get past but it blows up the horror behind it so there's my gm intrusion that was an, another layer of grit they just added something to that moment you know, and that's just me, you know, spitballing an example. And just thinking about particular. what you just said, you know, um, I actually think that you could possibly also lower the cipher limit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, instead of, um, you know, three, the normal three for adepts and two for pretty much everyone else, you could make it two one. Yep. Because, I, you know, I think some, when, when, not to hop on when I think about grit, but scarcity you know like the dark sun feeling like that you know stuff the more scarce an item is you know the, it's, it's harsh yeah it's harsher it's more important so yeah so there is more of a decision that you have this really cool item that could blow up in your head if you use it but you also don't want to use it because you might not get another one anytime soon you know what mm -hmm. i mean it adds a different label, layer, uh, layer of decision making. And uh, on top of that, if you wanted to just expand it a little bit further and mm -hmm. you're running not just a gritty one shot, but a gritty campaign, mm -hmm. you can have the characters eventually find like maybe a bigger bag or, you know, mm -hmm. something that increases their cipher limit to the normal amount. That way they mm -hmm. still have that advancement to look forward to narratively. Um, yeah. And it still adds that mechanical benefit as well, because now they can hold more ciphers. Yeah. Well, that that should be something you we can just add that across the board that advancement in the game you know brings you to cipher levels you know or you know because now it's more difficult overall to advance which is an interesting concept nice nice thing to throw in here out i mean i honestly didn't mean it as a character advancement per se with exp but that would be something excellent to add in in you know a gritty game like why not add an advancement for you know your capacities because again that makes sense for the kind of game you're running doesn't right. hurt anything and yeah adds another layer yeah. to that grittiness and i think that's a good spot to kind of wrap up that particular idea and move to our next one so, Shock and Madness rules, uh, page 282 to 283 in the CSR, 
are great rules and they're great for like when you're playing, you know, horror games or you're bringing something like Call of Cthulhu, which of course has its own level of grittiness or so on and so forth. But for other games, hey, nice, <laughs> nice book. Mm. Uh, but for other games, you know, I came up with the idea to kind of reskin Shock and Madness to trauma and fatigue. Okay. Um, trauma will be damaged to your pools as harder to heal. So like a traumatic event, you know, you broke your leg or, you know, you got a pulled muscle or so, or so on and so forth. So the concept or the idea behind that was if you've taken half or more damage to a pool, even though you haven't gone down on a damage track, you've experienced trauma. So until you recover your points, enough points to be higher than half your recovery pool, all recovery rolls are hindered. So, you know, maybe you would take, you would only get half the amount rolled on the dice. So rolling a six would only give you three points to recover as opposed to the full six points that you would get. Um, the concept of fatigue is caused by the depletion of your pool. So when a PC has lost at least 75% of a pool, um, things are just harder. And at this point, um, any attempt related to that pool is hindered until you bring that pool above 75%. So those two concepts, I think, work, work really well, given the sense of, you know, mechanically, it's, it's, it's a rough world out there, you know. When I see these two, um, like what you call alternative uses of shock and madness, it makes me want to run a like a Vietnam War game, uh, <laughs> uh, because I, I could definitely see the trauma, you know, you like like explosions happening all around you. Your characters running through foxholes, running through the jungle, right? And that has to have a lasting effect on your character. And this is a like a codified hard rule that you could add in to create that sort of tension in your character. I really like it. I really like the trauma and I like the fatigue for that matter. Yeah, I was actually going to touch on the fatigue one because um, that is an excellent, excellent, like, um, what is it, extrapolation mm -hmm. on the base ideals of Cypher System, right? So in Cypher System, it's, you know, resource management of the stats, right? And, you know, it kind of um, represents how fatigued or tired your body gets from using abilities from using effort all that stuff right so the more you use up the more tired you get so it kind of makes sense like to have that fatigue threshold where your character gets below 75 percent of whatever that pool is and now things are just harder for them because the body is already tired it's just taking what's already in cypher system and adding a level to it what if if that makes sense so let's say you're what is it you're speed is 10 or whatever and it drops to i'm bad at math whatever 75 percent of 10 is it, it drops eight to three. Oh, it's three yeah so if it drops below that then things are hindered until you get it back up it just it's a really good way to represent the physical mental toll that the body is undergoing in these gritty games and yeah. here's the other aspect of it for me it's and we're going to touch on it but it's a mechanical representation of the cinematic nature of cypher system whenever i look at these things like this it, it puts me in the mindset of watching you know uh like movie that, that well hopefully you've seen it out uh die hard uh, i haven't oh wow <laughs> okay i love this guy <laughs> but die hard the, the the final sequence in die hard is a prime example of that john mcclain is beaten raggedy tired you know his you know his speed and might pool are depleted you know he's relying solely on intellect and you know mm -hmm. it's just a great moment and i think these are like great mechanical representations that can help people get to that place narratively but we're going to talk about that later yeah I, I i think i think that um i think you brought up a great point dean i think the one thing i'm realizing as we're talking about this is that when, when we're discussing the mechanical, like what can we add mechanically to create grittiness, it's inherently making more bookkeeping. And I, I think that normally happens with any, you know, in any game system when we start talking about adding additional mechanics or changing mechanics. But I think that um, when we go into the narrative portion, it's actually gonna like, um, 
remove some of the bookkeeping, if that makes any sense. It's so it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. You know what it's, I'm saying? Yeah, it's very interesting. Like, I'm just realizing this. Even though I think all these rules are good, I do think that they're good with the, with like, hey, if you want to add this grip, you might have some additional bookkeeping to right. keep track of. Because it's going to keep on going, like, if I move on to the, the next one. But, you know, uh, we took the idea from depletion from artifacts. And because we're gritty games, right? And we applied them to armor and weapon depletion. And with gritty games, your equipment matters. Everything doesn't last forever. And I think one of the big things that we're seeing is that in a normal game, the stuff that we usually bypass and don't think about, you have to pay attention to in a grittier game. So what about adding depletion rolls to armor and weapons on, you know, in a more regular basis to make them seem matter more? You know, and we can even give a, a like a rating base on armors, like say, you know, light armor would be 10, medium would be 20, heavy armor would be 40. And, you know, every time it blocks or every time it takes damage, it would it makes it easier for the weapon to deplete when you do make those rolls. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, know or, what... Oh, go ahead, D. I say, or, or if you use those same ratings and mm. just use them as, you know, like pool numbers for the, the, the armor itself. Yeah. So, yeah, light armor is 10 points. It has 10 points but every time you it blocks a point of damage it reduces that armor by that amount mm -hmm. so when it's zero that armor is destroyed you know mm -hmm. which is you know instead of worrying about making a depletion roll on the other side is like what's what you're saying with the weapons mm -hmm. that's how you could kind of you know uh you know maybe every every four or five shots you make them make a depletion roll did the weapon jam did it run out of ammo you know stuff mm -hmm. like that just to add those 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 elements I'm, I'm trying to always think when i think it's cypher for me the mechanics go hand in hand with the narrative so i'm always trying to marry the two you know because i think that's something that monty and the guys have shown us you know with the rules itself how the rules support the narrative you know but um oh. trying to support it too no go ahead I mean, um but yeah just to piggyback a little bit off that um, the the depletion or whatever role, I really like this idea because in a gritty game, like just to piggyback what was previously just said was the minutia is what really matters in these gritty games. And in most games, like most narrative heavy games that you run a cipher system, this stuff gets bypassed because it adds nothing to the narrative. Right. But when you're playing this certain type of game, it adds a ton of that gritty feeling that you're aspiring for. Because now you have to worry about, hey, my armor is protecting me, but now it can break. Hey, yeah. my weapon is dealing damage to the enemy, but now it can break. So now it kind of adds that, hey, it, depending on what approach you uh, decide to take on depletion or, you know, whether it be like the depletion role of an artifact or um, a, like just a flat like resource rating where it blocks a certain amount of damage, deals a certain amount of damage and it breaks. You have to take, it gives you like that choice of like hey do i use my shield to protect me now my armor to protect me now do i put it away for a more crucial time like it adds that layer of grit um and i say that because in like a sort of a gritty game and where that minutia matters and um it really builds to those moments of like uh pressure where the pcs have to decide whether they have to use their resources now or later and again that in my eyes is a big part of that grit or adding grit to your game is making that resource management matter a lot more. Yeah, um, what what we're trying to do, I I would I think, is we're trying to give you options to add that mechanical grit element. Like I, I we're giving you two different valid choices to to use when it comes to making equipment matter mechanically to give you that grit feeling. You know, mm -hmm. and I think I think both of them work extremely well. You know, so it, it doesn't, I don't think you could go wrong using either method. And they're both very simple and quick and to the point. Granted, like like we said earlier, it adds additional bookkeeping, but I think that that's, if you want to add those elements mechanically, you're just going to have to deal with having a little extra bookkeeping. And, and I'll add to it in this sense. <laughs> it's Cypher system. Um, GMs, we don't have a lot of 
excess bookkeeping to do. <laughs> get us focused. So that would that's be, a fact. <laughs> that would be, you know, that would be just a little bit of something that you might have to add to your toolkit for that particular game. And, you know, 90% of the time, I think the people who want the gritty hardcore games have a tendency to be drawn to that anyway. Yeah. So, exactly. Um, any, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm just saying, so my final thought on that whole process is that, you know, so we're giving you some options to still be able to focus on your story, but, you know, change the, change the, the variables. Yeah, um, but just to pick it back a little bit off what Dean said before we move on, um, it kind of goes hand in hand, minutia and grit, like uh, or bookkeeping and grit, because without the bookkeeping, that sort of you know pressure from the resource management isn't there, so you the the bookkeeping is kind of necessary, and like Dean had said, you know most people who are trying to play a gritty game like this don't particularly mind that extra bookkeeping. And again, there are narrative ways that, you know, lessen bookkeeping in such a way, or in a, in a bit of a way, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but since we were talking about weapons and stuff, um, another way to make a game really greedy um, is a way that they touched upon in the uh, Vert RPG. Um, and that's, they just increased the damage of weapons just flat all around. So in the vert setting, you know, everything is a little more lethal. So like light weapons do four damage, medium do six, heavy do eight. And and that's a big difference from what is it, the two, four, six from base cipher? Mm-hmm. And yeah, and just, just that little increase alone adds like lethality or le- le- being lethal <laughs> to the <Yeah>. game. <laughs> and, um uh, and as if you're looking for a gritty game, that's also kind of part of it. That that threat of you know almost anything can kill you at a moment's notice if you're not careful. I absolutely love and wanted to talk about this because I have strong feelings about this. I I, I think when people see a set like damage base or whatever it is, you know. And it's written in the book, it's the raw, it can't be changed. And who says that? You know, like, we do it all the time when it comes to damage. You know, I'll give you the perfect example. When we ran our Godfather Mice game, right, it made no sense to have two, four, six when we were dealing with different size animals. So every animal had a different damage track. Like, who cared? Like, when a cat was attacking a mouse, Guess what? He was doing six, eight, twelve. You know, and you know when a dog was attacking a cat, he was doing four, six, eight. Right. You know, the whatever mood and feel, whatever how lethal you want a game to be, how how threatening you want your players to feel, mess with the damage ranges because it, the first time they get hit and they be like, "Oh, this guy hit me with a bat. That's a medium weapon. I'm taking four. And you you hit him with." I'll take eight points of damage. What? Whoa, whoa. They're not going to want to get hit with a bat again <laughs> and, for the rest and, of the session. And, <laughs> and here's another convention, too. And this is where, like I said, that's what a lot of people don't think about. Think about it Think about it in this sense, too. Cypher system has, the, you have the ability to spend effort on an attack. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you're thinking a baseball bat. That baseball bat does eight, but guess what? He just spent a level level of effort. He just did eleven points of damage with a baseball bat. You have ten might. Oh, good. you're on damage track already. That's one of those things, and that's such an awesome aspect of cipher system. You know, in the fact that you don't have to. I know everybody loves to roll dice, but I love the fact that you don't have to roll dice. It doesn't. It's not hard to do the math. The only thing I will say about damage that I feel it needs to be said because I know somebody's going to watch this video and immediately reply with this. Be consistent with your damage. Mm-hmm. If, if, because I will say that, like, if, if you, you, if I hit you the first time with the bat and it, and it does eight points of damage, the next time I hit you, it better do eight points of damage. Right. I, as a player, I would say that. And as, be, because I'm not trying to advocate changing the damage track on the fly. I'm saying before the, the game starts, right. if, if a baddie has a different damage track, know that beforehand. You know, could, 
GMs changing rules is fine in my opinion as long as they're consistent. That like oh, absolutely. I, I expect consistency as a player and as a GM. So the only advice I would definitely give, because I, I could definitely see that in the comments, is you could definitely chase damage, um, mess with the damage track, and I encourage all GMs to do so. Just be consistent about it. Right. And I mean, and, and that's another thing. If you're going to do something like that, we were talking about with the, you know, the different animals playing the Godfather mouse mm -hmm. game. But even like if you wanted to add something like this to your, your, your fantasy game, you know, ogres, you know, ogres get a plus four to all the damage. So instead of their light damage is six, their medium damage is eight, you know, their heavy damage is 12. Boom, done. You know, or 10, whatever it would be. You know, but like you said, you can just do a, 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 a flat bonus for a different race or somebody who's supposed to be consistently stronger, you know. And vice versa. It can go the opposite way for more lethality, too. Because if you start saying, um, like we were saying, that, you know, you're fighting against a bigger creature, guess what? Your damage is reduced. They have, a, they have a natural defense against you because you can't generate enough force to hurt them unless you're using some kind of equalizer. So, but like Anthony said, consistency. Work those ideas out, those concepts out beforehand, you know. And I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm done. No, so, and and I will say this before we move on to the next topic because if we can't really beat this one too much, it's just increasing numbers. But I will say this though, as a GM, um, and a, I guess the freshest GM of us three, um, I did feel a certain kind of way, especially from like I started learning with D and D five E how to GM. Mm. I took those stat numbers from the book as like law basically i was like oh this goblin is gonna do six that or whatever 2d6 that's the damage he does period when i transitioned to cypher system i saw again in the you know the creature part of the book or the beast year is like hey this thing does four damage or whatever you know whatever it says in the base i'm just like all right you know what it's gonna do six in my game or you know it's like i decided uh, like you know I, I realized that it's like what Anthony was saying. It's a guide. Like, these, these like, numbers, like, in the book, they're just there to say, hey, this is what we think that the, the, this creature should do. But you can change those numbers willy-nilly, but consistently, to make your game either more gritty or less, you know, less lethal or whatever have you. You, you can adjust, like, there's, there should be no qualms or you shouldn't feel bad about adjusting the information that's in the book. That's just the point I wanted to make yeah. as, as one of the fresher GMs. Just as a, you know, if you're a fresh GM watching this, you shouldn't feel afraid to mess with the numbers. Right? I mean, not only should you not be afraid, you should be encouraged to do so. Because when, when you mess with the, the, the like, um, either adventure or monster stat blocks or whatever, it's going to make it your own. The, the, the purpose of um, GMing is to be able to tell your own stories with with the players, right? You know, like when you get a written adventure, okay, it could be fun. Like I'm not knocking anybody that plays an adventure verbatim, like, you know, exactly written as the book. But I, as a player, I wouldn't enjoy that. I want your personality as a GM to be, you know, on display when you, even when you're running a written adventure. And it's just the same thing should apply for creatures and monsters from stat blocks. I want your take of this creation. You know, I, I want to... I want I want your creativity along with the information that's given in this monster stat block to make it original to you. So it's memorable to me that hey, when Dean runs goblins, they do this. You know, <laughs> that's cool. You know? Well, you know, and that's perfect to lead into the next thing we we're gonna talk about. And it's like adjusting enemy abilities, you know. And if you think about it, that's that's a direct thing that you know we kind of just took from D and D, the D and D style process. Mm -hmm. You know, character structure, class structure. So my thought process was like if you have elite enemies, they all have a special ability of some sort. You know, um, also modified damage, like I was saying earlier when we were talking about like you know a dra a, a giant or a, an ogre doing such and such. You know bosses and the right hand man of the boss have at least two special abilities you know and the first thing that comes to mind is like when i ran my war game 
Um, I had this guy, he was the lieutenant to the big balls, to the big bad of the game, you know, and he carried a Tommy gun, you know, and his Tommy gun, you know, you know, 60s guy with the brim and the whole nine, but, you know, he was lethal with this thing. You know, he, he had the spray ability down, you know, stuff like that. So he could attack three characters, you know, so I had three characters making a defense role. So just stuff like that adds a level of lethality. And it also adds your own stylized way of still keeping the narrative and the action going without weighing yourself down. But you can, you know, you can uh, target the players, you know, how or should I say, bring the players into that level of, oh, my God, this dude is scary. You know. So, uh, oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, I would just say to piggyback off that, um, again, if you're not, like, not everybody is super creative. Not everybody can, again, not to say that's a bad thing. It's just some people mm-hmm. aren't, you know, they, they don't find themselves feeling as creative. I feel like anybody could be creative. It's just most of the time you get in your own way. But either way, um, what I was getting at is if you're not, if you feel like you had a roadblock on how to make a character unique or an NPC in this situation, how to make a baddie unique, um, you know, if you are creative, you can just, you know, have a little description of it, base the abilities on off of like what where the the character comes from blah 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 whatever have you but if you're a little less creative and you're having a hard time the revised cypher system core book is an excellent resource for this because you can just flip through the ability section find one you think is cool find two or three that you think are cool give it to your and your baddie and bing bang boom now they're unique i think the way that like this is definitely a DD concept you know, I remember a fourth edition was really big on this. You know, they would give you versions of an elite version of a, of a creature, you know, a, a, a basic mob. Uh, what's that? Uh, what, what's the, the lowest of the low version? It's been a while since a I played minion. D&D. Yeah, a minion version of, <laughs> of the same creature. Right. And I think what why this applies to grit is, you know, like, you could have to throw three of the same bad guy, three of the same, you know, henchmen, uh, police officer, whatever it is that you're using, whatever setting you're running. And they could all be three different levels. So it doesn't have to be, you know, like police officers are level three, you know, corrupt cops are level three. So every time I run into a corrupt cop, it's, he's going to be a level three. You know, especially when your players know that, hey, I've already established that, I'm going to have detectives and elite special forces police, you know, and they they could be any sort of range. Right. It, cre- it creates that mystery. And, it, it you know, as a player, it creates that mystery like, okay, this cop looks like the other cop, but he might be two levels higher. So, you know, before you make that first role in combat, it affects your decision making in the game. And that's what grittiness is about. Grittiness is about protecting your resources and you know fearing the unknown it, you know? and exactly like um oh sorry you good or what i was just saying I'm, I'm glad anthony brought it up because again i'll correlate it back to something people can see and have seen and relate to which was the original batman in 1989 michael keaton just the end of the movie and batman is basically wrecking shop on all the Joker's minions. And then he gets to that last security guard dude, you know, with the sunglasses on. And this guy is wearing Batman out. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Batman had to get tricky. You know, he had to go ninja on him because just standing there toe to toe, Batman was getting handled. So it was one of them situations you're going, oh. Who, who who is this dude? You know, so it's like that. That could be a, a reoccurring NPC that you might want to put in your game or something, if you think about it in those respects. You know, or he, you don't even have to go that far. Now, every time they fight a security guard, is he going to be one of those guys? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, uh- Okay, no. no, no, and I was just gonna what I was gonna say before, just to piggyback off what you were saying about like protecting your resources from the unknown. Mm-hmm. On top of making you know the the level 
kind of wild. They don't know if it's an experienced bodyguard or whatever or an inexperienced one. You can still, again, pull, give them unique abilities here and there. Like, there might be three identical-looking security guards or whatever corrupt officers, but then one of them has this ability because they've been on the force for 10 years or whatever, so they have this special ability. And, again, they might approach it, and then going forward, like, after that encounter, they might think, hey, does that cop have this special ability? Does that corrupt cop have that special ability? Like... It's like they again. It le- it leaves them to try to protect their resources from the unknown. You know this. I know this. This is just hilarious that you you made me think about it. Now I'm thinking. You know, you know, you know, gonna have to have a cop with you know the special ability pistol whip. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Wait, wait a minute. Did he just like? He's like a level three cop, but pistol whips at level six. You know. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, yeah. you know what it made me think about? Like just even watch it, it made me think of Pootie Tang. Remember exactly. how he could take he could take his belt off and hit you and then put his belt back on? <laughs> oh, you gotta watch Pootie Tang. Yeah, that's another one I haven't seen. <laughs> Alright, so that'll be the perfect intrusion. So let's go into that. Right? You know, GM and places player intrusions. GM intrusions can be found on page four or eight of the um the CSR and player intrusions could be found on page 21. There's a lot of things we could do with um, GM and player intrusions to increase, you know, a grittiness feel mechanically. And one of them, you know, when we were talking about this video earlier that Dean brought up, which made perfect sense, on the player intrusion side, before the rule even came out, we used to charge two XP for a player intrusion. So, and we used to allow a little bit, it was, I mean, you could actually do more with your player intrusions. It was almost on the level of a GM intrusion. Like, it didn't have to be based on your character type, but it, it cost twice as much. And that is one way of definitely adding grit because it's, it's absorbing more of your resources, more costly for you to affect the narrative. Right, you know, so that's definitely one rule we could do, and this is one that I personally like. The GM gets a free group intrusion every session. That that is definitely an awesome thing to add grittiness to that uh, situation because, um, especially if you and again if you're doing something like this, it should be stated mm-hmm. beforehand so the players know like, hey, I'm not I'm not going to bend the rules on the fly. Like, yeah. hey, this is something that's you know expected. This- yeah, but every then, session this is going to happen. But the cool thing about it is that even though they know it's part of the session, they don't know when it's going to happen. Right. <laughs> so it has that, they always have that in the back of their mind, like, oh no, is he going to drop that group GM intrusion now? Is he going to drop, like, yeah. and that adds that grittiness because, again, you're trying to protect your resources from the unknown. And, and the, other part, <laughs> the other aspect of it, too, if you get a free in, a GM intrusion like that, it can't be denied. Yeah. You it's going to happen. Yeah. And, and on top of that, if you want to add more grittiness, just to piggyback off that rule, you could just remove the whole option to deny it. Deny GM intrusions. It's right. just, hey, you're getting a GM intrusion right now. Or, you can't deny it. Or, or you can yeah. it. You still get the XP. Yes, the but, AXP still but, happens. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. but, but you can't deny it. But right. that has to come with a level-headed GM because, you know, you can't yeah. just be going, ah, GM intrusion, GM intrusion. Yeah. Oh, and <laughs> like, like, like with everything else, when, when we start dealing with player A, Agency, all this has to be discussed beforehand. Like we said earlier, consistency is the key. So even if you want to apply any of these rules, and we're not saying that any of these rules will actually work because we probably haven't tried half of them. Yes. But if you do, do want to try them, you should definitely have a discussion with your your you know gaming group beforehand. Say, what hey, look, we want to attempt this. What I would suggest is kind of write out your rules and just have them on a sheet of paper or you know or let the players have copies so everybody's aware of what my mechanical aspects of this game are going to be you know what what mechanics have we changed in this way when as we try them out as they work we'll see what works and what doesn't you know and maybe at the end of your first session you guys can do what is it the the, the roses and thorn thing yeah. from you know powered by the apocalypse where you really discuss it so that's always something, and that, that that again sticks with that consistency. That sticks with the whole idea of a session zero, and then you know maybe the end of session zero. Work and work. I, I think intrusions as a whole, both player and GM, is probably your best friend, mechanically and narratively, 
to inject grit into any campaign. Yeah. I, I think that, the, you know, you can create mechanics to go along with intrusions that can add grit, or you could just make your, narratively, make your intrusions way more grittier than you would normally in, you know, any other game. Mm -hmm. Definitely makes sense. Um, but now that we're touched on, like, EXP expenditure, right? Um, what you call it with, you know, bumping up the cost, you know, maybe they can't deny it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um we can go and look at another feature mechanically that can make it a little more gritty is with the uh, character advancements of learning new skills and abilities, right? So, you know, each character is going to advance at some point, you know, whether you have milestone advancements or, you know, um, you know, actual paid advancements as per raw. Um, but something to add a little more grit to it and something, again, it's not really, excuse me, it's something we kind of really thought of. I've, I don't think, I don't know if any of you have done it in a game, but I definitely haven't, but it seems very, like, a really awesome way to do it is when a character goes to learn a new ability or skill through their, you know, advancements, you know, whenever it happens in the story, they can't actually get the advancements till they do something in the narrative to make it happen, such as they can't just become magically trained at survival while they're out in the wilderness, you know, or, you know, wherever, until they speak to, a, like, an experienced survivalist. Or maybe, you know, they have to have a narrative uh, way to make it happen. Like, they, they just can't magically learn the ability or skill. You, you need a log logical explanation for why you're learning this ability. Right. And so you, you, you need to... Skill. And you need to actually role play it out in gameplay. This is actually coming up in our Keeper the Borderlands game. We have one of our players that's essentially playing a warlock, but he wants to pick up armor skill. And he, it, it, it didn't come for me because we've been hand weaving. You know, we've been more concentrating on the actual story. We've been <laughs> hand weaving like the leveling up process. But he wanted to pick up heavy armor. Right, he wanted to wear heavy armor. Oh, he still does, and um, he suggested, "Hey, can I in game have somebody train me on how to use heavy armor? So it makes sense why I'm picking up a heavy armor skill." Right. Normally, you know, we would, you know, hand kind of just say like, "Okay, you picked up the heavy armor skill. You can use heavy armor." In a grittier game, you should make the players actually make the accomplishment of, hey, if I picked up this ability, I got to explain in game because like we said earlier, every resource matters, you know, and uh, getting new resources have to be significant if you want to make them all important and if you want to make them all matter. So when they do pick up a new resource, you have to add it into the game itself. Right. So you know, one, if they lose it, you know, it's more like, oh, man, I lost this ability or I lost this uh, equipment, whatever it is. Right. You know, and that's the whole point. You know, you got to have a mentor, you know, if it's a skill or an ability or, you know what, there might be a special facility you have to go to and convince somebody or you're stealing a prototype of a weapon or whatever it might be, whatever those, those, uh, mechanical tropes that you want to build into the narrative whatever they have to be and you can even also use you know of course existing rules or rules as written and give it an xp cost you know make it you know it's a long-term benefit or it's a mm. you know whatever or even like with skills you know you know don't even though they get to keep them permanently but put a put an xp cost on it, make yeah, it cost. I, I, I would like i like that idea the only thing i would tweak me personally is it's free if you want to go through it in game to accomplish it but if you want to bypass that then there's an xp cost that works too yeah. it, it definitely yeah. makes sense as far as like player yeah. intrusions go um yeah. you might want to make them a little more costly um yeah. not like create like three or four like two yeah. instead of the one because yeah. they're like um essentially using the advancement to bypass a gritty storyline and again you know it's exp they're supposed to be rewarded for having it and using it yeah and again in a gritty game you want the resources to really really matter and really have a like an effect so this would be a great way to have exp matter more and on top of that again if you're having the characters have to go through a narrative 
thing to learn their skills and ability, again, adds that grit because, they're, you know, brings more resource management into play. Um, yeah. I mean, I think this is actually perfect because it, it leads in perfectly to, you know, creating a, a narrative feel of grittiness in your game. So let's talk about it. Um, you know, maybe if we did that, you know, you could say, uh, you could describe the damage taken in more specific terms. You know, even if the player is healed, they've got bruises left over or scars remaining. Um, you know, you don't have to put a mechanical effect on it, but you could put a very huge narrative effect on it. Like, you know, let's just say the character's handsome, you know, or, you know, known for his, his style and flavor, but now he got a black eye, you know. You, you're not going to be as smooth with that black eye. You don't necessarily have to give them a hindrance or anything on a die roll, but you just basically make it known, you know, that. I, I, I mean, I think this is like the GM's wheelhouse. Like, I, I think one of the the most important things of of, of creating a, a, any sort of game, whether it's gritty or comedy or whatever you're aiming for, is you got to know how to narratively pace and set the tone for your game, right? Mm -hmm. And like what Dean just said, you know, like um, the effects of damage, just because someone does a recovery roll, doesn't mean that that damage went away. It just means that it no longer hurts and it's no longer threatening their vitality, right? So if someone, if we played a game and someone went through a long dragged out fight where they got, their might pull got dropped to zero, Guess what? In game, descriptively, they're gonna have bruises and scars and cuts, and the, the short their shirt is gonna be teared. That doesn't go away on a recovery roll. No. And so the next scene, when they run into a you know an NPC, their first reaction should be, "Oh God, are you okay? You know." Do, you know, you're still bleeding. Is everything all right? Instead of that, it miraculously is forgotten. You know, I went and, you know, I, we all guilty of it. We all do it because, you know, you want to keep the story moving forward. But in a gritty game, you can't really do that. You have to concentrate on the little things narratively to set the tone. But, but the, and that, I think you just said it, though. In a gritty game, these are things you think about. In a, in a typical game, you know, especially when they make mm -hmm. a recovery roll or anything else, mm -hmm. you're thinking of the magic healing potion or, you know, the, the, the cleric or, or wizard casting a heal spell or something. That, that's kind of a thought process. But in a gritty game, you know, I think the thought process when you even look at your narrative should be, you know what, I have to describe this dank and, you know, desolate or it has to be dark and and you know the the vapors are coming up from the sewer covers and stuff like that just to give that that emotional tug so what you're saying anthony is perfect you know you get cut you got bruises you know you got you got scars you there's you know basically there's a a, a dossier written on your face that you didn't know was written there or a minute again, you did because you can still feel the pain. And you can you can also experience grit, not necessarily physical, but emotional. You right. can emotional scars. You know, like when characters die or characters hurt. You know, as a GM, you could have the NPCs literally affected and change the personality of those NPCs according to what happened in the narrative. And right. And I'm just saying, you just made me think about it. You just said something perfect because that will go back to what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about a mechanic. Now you can tie that visual aspect, that narrative aspect to trauma and fatigue. You know, now the character's been traumatized. So now they see flashing lights. What is that? You know, <laughs> you know, or you hear explosions. You were talking about the Vietnam game, you know, or, or like Twilight 2000 or something, you know. I mean, it is it is an excellent point to make because um, a, a lot of the stuff. I mean, especially me, as a fresher GM, um, I hate to just throw that around so much because I don't think I'm that fresh anymore. But out of our group, we are. I am. Um, I found myself not describing things as detailed 
as you know, like let's say they're in a combat, it's like, oh yeah, the sword swings at you, take three damage, blah blah blah. It is what it is. But in a gritty game, you definitely want to be very detailed with that stuff because that's what really brings them emotionally to that grit. It's like, hey, oh, I just it's not just hey, I'm took some damage, it's like, hey, my character's bleeding, like I look different because of what's going on. Like they really should like feel immersed in that moment like hey i want to prevent my character from getting hurt because again it's a it's going to hinder myself going forward not maybe mechanically but like like anthony was saying the npcs are going to react to you differently because now you look beat up mm -hmm. um and it's just it's something to keep in mind especially again as a fresher gm don't gloss over it just because it's a little bit quicker just because it's a little bit mundane in this gritty game you want to be as detailed as you can when it comes to these moments yeah, it's, it's all about setting that tone. You know, it's a lot, it's a, a lot easier for a skilled GM to create a grit or, or a feeling without adding mechanics if they're good at setting the tone and creating an atmosphere that invokes emotion, right? For those that are not good at that or, or, or are not as skilled, as a GM that is, then you have them, then you can lean on mechanics to provide that, you know, that same feeling that you're going for, but you can add it mechanically. But uh, an experienced GM doesn't have to do that. An experienced GM could actually invoke those same emotions and feelings just by the way they describe things and set the tone. You know, and I, I think that me personally, I'm not great at that. Like I, I'll be the first to admit it. You know what I mean? But it doesn't hurt to try those things. And, you know, a everyone should try regardless if you fail or not, because that's the whole point of GMing is to learn and get better. And that's the reality. You will get better at it. Yeah. You'll, you'll get better at it, at invoking that, those, those emotions and those feelings. Um, you know, and there's, there's other things you can do. You may not necessarily have all the chops at maybe describing something, but what if you're a guy who has the ability to do voices? You know, figure out what's in your toolbox. You know, we, we always talk about this toolbox. A GM's toolbox is very, number one, and a GM's toolbox is eclectic. So there's going to be a lot of stuff in there, but your stuff may not be the same thing that's in Al's box. And it may not be the same thing in Anthony's box. And I think what Anthony said is so real and so visceral that it makes perfect sense. Try figure out what you have, what resources you have, you know. And um, before we even go in, what Dean said, and if you fail, so what? Try again. Absolutely. Uh, but before I move into the next <laughs> the next question, I, I think the fear of failure is like a GM's worst enemy. You know, like you shouldn't be afraid to fail because that's the only way you learn is through failure. And, uh, uh, hold on, before we go <laughs> again, Dean. No, yeah, before, before we go on, because you, what you just said is very pertinent, Anthony. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of people today put too much pressure on themselves. We are in the, the, the nirvana of gaming, but you and I have a huge advantage because we started in an era where you didn't have the Matt Mercers and the Matt Covilles and all of that all over the internet and everything. <clears throat> so we had to do it. We just had to figure it out because we started so long ago, you know? So it's a double-edged sword that you live with. So yeah, guys, get out there, do it. Don't worry about prep, <laughs> you know, failing. All right, to go back to the topic, yeah. I mean, those were some jewels we dropped in mid-video, but another way narratively to affect, you know, to apply grit to a game is make equipment and supplies matter. I mean, we, we keep on going into, which is we're kind of hopping in every you know, aspect of this video is, is that everything's a resource that can be used and lost in the drop of a dime. So, which I normally hate this, but count equipment. If you're playing a modern game, how many bullets do you have? And, you know, remind your players, hey, you fired four shots, you had 12 bullets, you know, you have eight bullets left, right? Ask when, when players are going on long journeys, ask if they have enough food or enough money to, to, you know, to travel. Make your inventory and your supplies matter. 
Yeah, and also oh. make them wear away, not mechanically, but just say, "Hey, GM intrusion, your you know sword broke." Um, and yeah, this this again, it it adds a little more bookkeeping, like we've been saying earlier, mm. but it's it's kind of essential for this sort of game because if like again in, in most other genres or settings or whatever have you this stuff is easily glossed over you can just say hey you had enough food for the trip oh hey you, you have more than enough bullets you know in your whatever bandolier but in a gritty game they need to feel like that stuff can go away or you know run out because without it there isn't that really that sense of danger of their supplies not being there when they need it you can add the bookkeeping or you could use the GM intrusion mechanic or to that. keep it narratively. Like, hey, yeah. you give a session with them giving free will, like go nilly willy on the fire in the machine gun. And then mid second session, go, hey, you go to change your clip and you realize G play a GM intrusion, you no longer have a clip. Yeah, you're so empty. what you yeah. empty. Or, you know, and the other thing too. Again, that's kind of the same similar thought I was having is they're on a journey, you know, they run out of supplies, you know, now narratively, you know, now we have to play out you either foraging for more or you found a, a inn or something, but how much money do you have? Do you have did you bring money, you know? So now we can role play these things out. Those things can add a narrative level and you know, um, you know, I, I got, I'm going to kind of save that because it kind of goes into the next uh, the next portion of the topic. But yeah, that's the whole idea. I, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say with, with supplies and equipment is that every little resource should matter. And every little resource should be concentrated on narratively in the story. Like have those discussions in game as characters. Like, you know, like either the NPCs with the players, like, Hey man, you know, uh, uh, do you have any extra spare rounds I could borrow? I'm running low, you know, and describe it in the narrative so the players are aware that not only is it important to them, it's important to everyone in the story, not only the players. Yeah, mm -hmm. those, those are definitely solid, solid pieces of uh, advice as far as the narrative of mm -hmm. uh, resource control. And on top of that, like this, like normally again this sort of role playing gets glossed over in most games because you just say hey i forage for mushrooms or whatever or <laughs> like you you just say like but in a game where you want it to feel gritty you really need to have like a good description of like how they're finding it or how they're coming across more of the resource or whatever have you or you know how it, it just kind of pushes home that hey we really need to ration what we have because it's so difficult to get more narratively um, because they might have to jump over like so many um, metaphorical hurdles just to get yeah. more food or more bullets or whatever have you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, let's keep this discussion going. Um, something else that can be done narratively um, to really increase the grit level, and we kind of touched on this with the damage aspect, is have the characters like uh, like appearance or like how they keep themselves, how they upkeep themselves matter more to the story. So, like, for example, like, in a gritty game where they're, like, surviving out in the woods or something for a lot of it, and they might not have access to, like, showers or something, and then they have to hide. Now, they haven't showered three, game, three days in-game, <laughs> they stink. So now it's easier for them to be, like, detected by an NPC who might be looking for something. Another good example is um, if the characters are just killing everything they come across, like, murder hoboing, now the guards have a reason to recognize them in the streets. Normally, they would just, you know, go about their business, you know, whatever. But now that they've been taking weird actions in a narrative, now narratively, they're going to have trouble scenes brew up because of the actions they've been taking. Another part of, or excuse me, the reason or the way that adds great is because now, you know, in most games, they, you might gloss over the fact that, hey, they robbed the store, there's no consequences. But in a greedy game, their actions have to have consequences, whether it be positive or negative. I, I even will go even a step further. Not only would it be, like, if, if a group is murder hoboing, like, I, I think their reputation would extend beyond just, like, the neighborhood the neighborhood they're going into. Right, you know, like, 
hold on a sec, dude. They, they whatever they do, they, they'll be able it will be able to extend way beyond the current story arc you in. Like their actions are gonna have consequences six, seven, eight sessions later. And you have to bring that back so the players realize that their actions will have consequences over the course of the entire campaign, not just one or two sessions. Well, that's what I was saying. I wasn't cutting you off. I was just saying their reputation precedes them. <laughs> you know, it's you know they're, they're it's out there now. Mm. You know. Oh. Um, uh, oh. Another thing I would have had to you know talk about with that is also you know depending on what type of game you're running, you could actually have you know that their appearance. They may not be disheveled. They may not. They may not be all bloody. They might be just normally dressed. But they're going to a foreign place. They're they're known strangers just because of their style of dress. Does that does that automatically put what what kind of onus does that put on them? You know, and these can bring up great role playing moments. You know, in your game. You know, how are people going to react? You know, does do, do the lowliest of people, you know, revere them? Are they reviled by them? Whatever the case might be. You know, um, these I mean. Are all things. These are all things we can think about. Dean, that's an awesome, like, a discussion. Uh, of course, I, I mean, I would even go a step further with consent of the players beforehand, of course. You know, you could actually deal with such social issues and topics that might not normally come up. You know, um, a, a lot of times certain topics get glossed over in games because they're uncomfortable. And frankly, most of us don't want to play in those games. You know, but in a gritty game, you can't touch some of those topics respectively, I mean, respectfully, and of course, having that consent discussion beforehand. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, and that's where again we've talked about it a couple times before in other videos that consent mm. in gaming form uh, mm. comes in handy um, because again, uh, in grittier games, as outlined in the definition above, it has that sort of like real, um, like down and dirty feeling and sometimes that comes with uncomfortable topics um, such as you know racial or social uh, differences or injustices or whatever have you and uh, especially with how the world is right now you don't want to just dive into a game having those topics without having that you know discussion beforehand um, but yeah, what I was going to say about this aspect was, uh, it's actually something I never thought about before, so thank you, Dean, for bringing it up, um, is that in most games, like, it is gloss over, uh, like, like let's say the, the PCs travel to another town or another province or whatever have you, they're just accepted as maybe strangers because they've never seen the person's face, but it's never like, hey, they're these people from that town because they're dressed this way. And that's honestly a awesome like aspect to take narratively to introduce that great like hey do we go into this town wearing our normal clothes do we try to find clothes that make us fit in do we blend in like depending on what kind of story you're trying to tell um it really adds that level of uh grit narratively because now again the players have to make a decision narratively on how they're going to approach um new npcs and new situations whereas in other games it might not have never come up because they're just strangers really and not like known as being like from another city or another group of people or oh, they don't even know that this other town or place harbors ill feelings towards those people so they right. might show they might just show up and then why is everybody so mean to us you know right, exactly right exactly you know um that's it, guys. This has like been this is great, great discussion, great way of you know setting the stage. So I think probably the best thing to do now is kind of to move this into uh, I guess you can say conclusion. Let's look at using some grit rules or applying some grit rules to a specific genre right quick. You know, we don't have to try to apply everything yeah. we come up with, but let's just pick a few things and apply it to it. You know. And so let's let's do it with the Wild West, you know. Yeah. I uh, I'll go first. Uh, I'll I'll because I tend to be a narrative GM. I'll go to the narrative rules first. So I'm a I'm gonna go with the uh, make appearance uh, characters appearance and so social interactions matter. I think with the Wild West, reputation definitely precedes you, whether you're playing outlaws or or 
sheriffs, you know, hunting outlaws, your, your name and your reputation is the utmost important. So that would be the one thing I would use. You know, the one rule I would definitely use is that whatever actions they do, have it matter more than one session and have their reputation. We could even add a mechanic to it, give them a reputation, a reputation pool that they could utilize points to either do positive or negative things that can, you know, replenishes over the course of a couple of sessions. Uh, that definitely yeah. makes sense. Um, I just want to hit touch that topic a little fast, what he just said, because that's awesome. Because the way Cypher System is built, giving anything just a resource number, it's such an, mm -hmm. like, it just fits in line with how the game is run. So there's so many, like, again, it adds a little bit more book bookkeeping, but in a gritty setting, again, it's not really a huge issue. And um, even with, like, let's say a reputation, like, resource, right? Um, let's say, like, you want to gamify it they can earn it by doing positive things for that group of people that gives the reputation they lose some mm -hmm. by doing you know yeah. things against that um sorry i, I just, mean so, sort of like the light and dark pool with fantasy flight games for star mm -hmm. wars let me say so um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i no, just wanted I, I, I didn't want to, to think that i came up with this original uh, oh no it, it, you know it, it, that immediately when you started talking made me be like oh Snap! That's the <laughs> Star Wars. It is. It is an awesome, yeah. awesome one to add as far as you know yeah. this stuff goes. But anyways, as far as what I would add from what we discussed, um, I would definitely go for in a Wild West situation the increased damage stuff, because in a Wild West, like let's say you, I, I haven't seen many Wild West movies or mm -hmm. cartoons or whatever have you, but as far as I know from like the not the stereotypes or like I guess the tropes. Um, is that when, you know, there's a duel or, like, a high noon or whatever mm. have you, like, a person gets shot once and they're down. Like, it's not like, hey, I'm going to shoot you, like, in, like, an action movie. Yeah. Like, there's multiple shots. Like, bam, bam, bam. It's like, hey, you get shot once. If, you know, you shoot, you have maybe, like, two or three shots to take. If one hits, that person is very hurt. <laughs> like, yeah. it's not... And on top of that, medicine is freaking hard. Was horrible back then. So even if you survived, you were losing a leg or whatever. Cause... So exactly, adding that lethality to to the game is definitely something you want to have in a Wild West situation. Um, and again, because um, there might be situations where there might be a shootout with like you know it's not just a one on one duel. It might be like a bandit versus sheriff group of cops type situation. But still, you know there might be a lot of bullets flying around. But one hit and still gonna do the same kind of thing where you know you still have like a, a variety of shots going through the air but you still have the lethality of if you get hit once it's gonna be a problem <laughs> so, that right there perfect then for me you know and just think of this we, we've all took one of the ideas that we pulled out and placed them on this game so mine is gonna be the trauma and fatigue rule you know so I think that just codifies everything we've been talking about you know first of all your reputation has preceded you whether it's good or bad or perhaps maybe you have no reputation and that could be a gameplay thing right there too because if don't nobody know who you are they might just walk up and smack you <laughs> i mean it's the old wild west you're in the foreign wild, you know what you know you might be pistol whip charlie you know that might be the guy that started the pistol whip. <laughs> you know but you got that. Then, like Al said, which is awesome, increased damage. Okay, we know bullets hurt. Bullets are dangerous, you know, <laughs> in this world. So, you know, even if you get hit with a small caliber gun round, you know, that's four points off your might pool, you know. And then with trauma and fatigue added in, yeah, you're healing the damage. But guess what? It still has lingering effects. You know, so, you know, it, it's great when you see the guy, you know, that's the guy walking around with it, with the tourniquet on his leg or the, the thing wrapped around his head, you know, <laughs> and, you know, or, or got the, remember the old wooden crutch they would have? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you could, like, put those three things in there and you think about it, those just three little rules just change the whole dynamic. And, of, of oh. And just to piggyback off that a little bit, just how the two rules are interplaying with each other, the increased damage and the trauma uh, specifically, how like it's harder for you to heal, it kind of also adds narratively to what Anthony was saying. Medicine's hard to come by. 
it's not the best medicine. So it's going to be much harder for you to recover from these hard-hitting bullet shots. And, again, it, it adds that grit not only mechanically, but narratively, right? So... Well, with, even narratively, what, exactly what you said, you got shot and survived. People are going to be like, yo, this guy got shot three times, and he's still gunfighting out there. Well, he goes to... Your reputation could perceive you for being able to take punishment, you know? <laughs> but uh, the, what I was going to say about the, the trauma part was, like, um, you know, you're taking a lot of damage from these bullets. It's harder for you to heal via recovery rolls, right? So that forces you narratively to seek out something that can heal you better than you can heal yourself. And again, it adds that grit level that you're looking for, because now the players aren't just looking at a mechanic that can just make them better with recovery rolls because even now they're hidden the recovery rolls are harder to do so now they have to seek out a doctor or they have to seek out a hospital or a shaman or whatever have you that can actually heal them better and and again it 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 creates wonderful moments for role play scenarios and 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 then you know to add to that you know I, i would take uh anthony's rule about your reputation um you know with your reputation that's how you end up earning your nickname. You know, <laughs> it's a Wild West game. So, you know, like you were talking about, you know, uh, you know, the guy who took three rounds, you know, he might be old diehard in the, you know, in the in the Wild West. And nobody knows his face. What was going to say, Al? His name, uh, his name would be Hard Swiss. <laughs> Get uh, it? Bullet holes, Swiss cheese. Yeah. Hard Swiss. <laughs> 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 they have Swiss cheese in the Wild, wild West. All right, you're, you're right. It's gritty. We got to be more real with it. My bad. <laughs> I, I, I was going to go with uh, Lucky Buck. Okay, Lucky Buck. However we think about it, but think about it this way. You may not know his face. Who are you, Lucky Buck? What? The Lucky Buck? You know... There you go. You know, you got those moments. You got those RPG moments. Those those great role play moments. It 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 just everything is feeding each other. You know, that's what we were saying. That's what I, what we always talk about when we talk about Cypher about the uh, mechanics supporting the narrative, and the narrative supporting the mechanics. So exactly. it's that give and take. And I think that's what we we really tried to do with this whole concept of bringing the grittiness to Cypher system. Is even though even though we were implementing mechanics, we still wanted to support the narrative, you know, because that's what Cypher is all about. You know, um, final thoughts, guys. I think my final thought is I, I I'm not entirely sure if we really hit on the grittiness, but one thing I am sure is that we hit on the concept of that any minor tweaks and changes could change your narrative in any direction you want to go. And it's okay to experiment. It's okay to make, you know, make less optimal choices as a GM if you feel like it's going to affect your story in positive ways. And go for it. Let's grow. Let's let's try to do things together differently. And um, we'll all learn from it. I mean, um, as far as my, my last thing, um, you know, I feel like we did hit, like, we, I mean, we may not have touched on the totality of what makes you know an rpg gritty or what can bring grittiness to your game uh, but we did hit a lot of strong points you know even if you know we didn't touch on a lot of you know, everything um you can definitely take even like we did with the wild west uh example just now we just took three of the examples we provided and that added an immense amount of layer layering as far as the grittiness of that game went um but as far as like you guys out there watching um, what if some things you have done to add grittiness to your cypher system game? Like, anything other than what we've discussed here? Definitely let us know. Um, because, you know, it's definitely awesome to spitball these ideas and, you know, just add more to our repertoires as GMs and, you know, you know, creatives. And, um, my final thoughts would probably be, you know, kind of echoing what, what my two compadres here said, you know, um, and the fact that we definitely, I know we definitely didn't hit on it. I've I've read tons of different takes on bringing some grit to their cipher system and everything else. Um, but don't be afraid to play with it. Don't be afraid to to do that because 
that's what Cypher System is all about. Cypher System is about being set free as a GM to tell the stories you want to tell. Um, and just remember, you know, Charles Ryan said it in one of his articles that, you know, the rules were written for the players. You know, the GM isn't bound by these things. So you can deal with your game the way you want. And you know what, guys? I'm just saying is, you know, let's keep playing Cypher. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony because uh, he has a couple of messages for you. Hey, guys. Um, first and foremost, thank you for watching our videos. We truly appreciate everyone that watches our videos. And, you know, but we need your help. Please like, share, and subscribe our videos because it allows other people to see our videos. The more people watch it, the more people are subscribed, the more people to hit that little notification bell. It really helps us out a ton. You know, we we, we enjoy having these, making these videos, and we hope that, uh, you know, anybody that listens enjoys our content. And if you don't, let us know how we could do it better. Put it in, in, you know, in the description box below, and we'll definitely, you know, one thing we're, we're not a, against is criticism because we take all criticism and we use it to make ourselves better, make ourselves better GMs and make ourselves better content creators. But if you do like our videos, you can support us in little ways. We have a Kofi set up, you know, with the link is down below in the description. You know, any little bit helps. It helps us with little things like Zoom costs. Or we also have an online store like the beautiful gear that Dean's wearing right now. And if you want a Cypher Unlimited shirt, hat, mugs, whatever, you know, do that as well. And thank you guys. We love you. Hey, yep. one last thing too. Just so you guys know, I'm going to spit it out there. We even have a special new shirt out there from our last session. It's a great shirt. You know, if you like Predation from Cypher System, it's a Predation related shirt. If you see it, when you see it, I'm not even going to tell you the slogan. You'll know it. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. And uh, yeah, thank you all for watching. And uh, yeah, stay being awesome. And from us at the CU, we will see you later. <laughs>